Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ambassador Richard Verma, distinguished guests, uh, friends assembled here, and uh, colleagues in the room, colleagues uh, in the anteroom, and those watching us uh, uh, live on the web. Uh, welcome to the Observer Research Foundation uh, for this session on uh, protecting our shared spaces and the fast evolving uh, US India partnership, which uh, his Excellency Richard Verma has agreed to speak about uh, for this afternoon session today. Uh, but first of all, I'm uh, especially delighted to welcome you, sir. Uh, Ambassador Richard Verma for Observer Research Foundation is a very special guest, I must say. Uh, you are sir, a person with keen legislative knowledge. Uh, you have in your various roles moved with ease from the private sector to the State Department. I won't go through the entire list, but uh, we know your illustrious career. And most importantly, has also been working in policy think tanks and now steering the uh, US-India relationship in New Delhi. And we as ORF uh, feel especially privileged uh, to uh, so, you know, recall our association uh, with Excellency Verma during his stint at the Center for American Progress, uh, where he was heading the India Initiative. And we had the privilege sir, of working with you at that time. Uh, many of you know that uh, he's been ranked by India Abroad as uh, one of the most important and influential Indian Americans and has consistently, which is most important, consistently, even at the most disappointing of times, and there have been several of them, uh, maintained a deep and unshakable belief in the potential of the US-India partnership. Uh, so we welcomed you in your new capacity in Kolkata, uh, where you overwhelmed the audience. Uh, then you were with us at the US-India Think Tank Summit. Uh, but this is your first official visit to our premises. So thank you for coming, and uh, I consider it uh, rather, you know, both symbolic and daring that you've come here to speak of this topic, uh, protecting our shared spaces. Uh, despite their you know, growing importance, these shared spaces, who many refer to as the global commons, uh, have never been vulnerable as they are today. Whether it is terrorists targeting uh, civilian networks, Paris threatening uh, vital sea lanes or cyber militias attacking computer networks, the capacity of small and organized groups to disrupt vital common shared spaces has uh, increased at a capacity which has never been experienced before. And these threats are not limited just to non-state actors. There are all kinds of agencies involved in this uh, whole game. Therefore, this is an issue which requires uh, the fullest attention of all countries, especially the India-US partnership and other big powers, given that uh, the interdependence and interdependence that we today enjoy uh, in the world is increasingly being enabled by the shared common spaces uh, that we live in. Now, the UN traditionally you know, identifies outer space, the high seas, and Antarctica as the global commons. But then what do you do with something like cyberspace, you know, which is a shared resource, which today has become the one space, the one area, uh, where the economies of nations have got so deeply integrated with each other, where you do not know where the interests of one nation begin and where the interests of the other nation end. And this is an interdependency which manifests itself, you know, 24 by 7 in all those zillion transactions zipping across the networks of huge financial transactions happening all the time. And even many of these transactions passing both in and out of the hands of rogue states and rogue actors. And unlike the other commons, this, this shared space is actually an invented space. It is an invented space it is actually owned and owned by both private and public enterprises, private and public agencies. There are IPR issues involved here. And yet it has developed features that make it near impossible uh, to not position the preservation and protection of the digital medium 
as the one that we are all collectively tasked with. So in a way, you know, the, the, the Hardin's old uh, depiction of uh, the tragedy of the commons, the so-called tragedy of the commons, where every individual tries to reap the greatest benefit from a resource until the demand for the resource overwhelms this availability and so on and so forth, I think is a weak analogy uh, to talk in terms of what we are here to discuss today. We are living in a world of interdependency. And in an interdependent world, uh, the classical economist's tragedy of the commons is probably the wrong metaphor uh, to even begin to problematize the issue. Uh, I would actually rather think of the study by, you know, uh, Bran Foddy on the subject of shared spaces, who found that as the supply of a resource deteriorates, then there can be conditions where the deterioration is at a rather low space, at a very low and easy pace. In those conditions, the participants do tend to increase their consumption of the shared resource. But what happens under conditions of rapid deterioration? What starts happening to shared resources? What this study finds is that under these conditions, it is interesting to see that the, how the consumption rates of various participants differ in the process. Subjects with high levels of trust consume far less than participants with low levels of trust. And that is a very, very important difference. In short, what plays the most important role in mediating the management of resource consumption and use is not so much the dilemma of the commons, but the factor of trust. So the key to managing the commons can be encapsulated in that one concept, in that one word, which is trust. It is not just trust of each other as uh, nations, but trust and ownership of the rules, the norms, of the architecture that defines the framework of the shared spaces that we are assembled, that we are assembled here to discuss. And if this trust exists, interdependency ensures that the commons will be prudently managed. And India and the US are indeed doing a lot and can do a lot together to build that vital trust in this architecture, in the rulemaking that goes into the defending commons, in, into you know, uh, making best use of these shared spaces. We believe in the vitality of these, in the free flow of information and trade for the health of our economies depends upon this, whether it is the sea, whether it is cyberspace, whether it is space where we have been having so many programs together. And I'm confident that under the leadership of Ambassador Verma, uh, we have actually begun to capitalize on some of the opportunities which exist in this area. And we at ORF sir, assure you that we will continue to be a strong supporter of this partnership in whatever we do in this area. Uh, the format of, for today is uh, very simple. Uh, we will have a talk by the ambassador, uh, following by a short round of uh, answers and some questions answers. And uh, <coughs> at the end of the day, then I'll request you, Raja, who we just back from Singapore, uh, to give us your brief wrap up of, uh, and uh, uh, conclude the proceedings with your thanks. Uh, so, Ambassador Verma, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's, um, it's really such an honor to be here with all of you. I feel like it's a, a rite of passage to come through uh, ORF and, and give at least one major talk, which I haven't done yet until now. I also feel like sitting between uh, Sanjoy and Raja, this is uh, two of the best minds when it comes to strategic matters and uh, the font of knowledge that, that comes out of this place and both of your pens and keyboards each day and each week is, uh, is really magnificent. And so it's, it's a privilege to be seated up here with you and, and the work that we've done together in the past uh, stands out uh, very clearly uh, for me. Uh, I saw as I was looking at my uh, Twitter feed uh, this morning that the ORF live tweeting uh, session with Ambassador Verma was taking place during the session. Um, and I'm relatively new to the to the kind of social media space over the last six or seven months, but I've I've 
many ways, but some of my favorite uh, tweets in the last uh, few months have, uh, <laughs> they've been very humbling, let's just say that. Uh, one of them was, uh, came in recently was, when are you actually going to do some real work? <laughs> That was one of my favorites. And then there was another one that came in, uh, said, the thing that you could do that would help us the most is if you closed the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I hope we get some, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get some interesting responses uh, today. But it's, it's really terrific to be here uh, with you. Um, I think all of you know, uh, last month uh, was the 10-year anniversary of the Civil Nuclear Initiative. And the, Vice President uh, actually gave a fairly major speech uh, commemorating the 2005 uh, Civil Nuclear Initiative. And when I look back over the last 10 years and see the amount of progress, and I know you've written a, a, a very interesting column on this, um, looking at how this relationship has been transformed in 10 years and the, and the data in all the category, whether it's trade or defense or people-to-people -people exchanges, is really, it's really compelling uh, data. And if you would even think 10 years ago that we would have such advanced cooperation uh, right now on nuclear matters or on space or on other forms uh, of high technology issues, they were really some of the most contentious issues between our, our two countries. Um, but today, uh, those issues are part of the foundation of the partnership that we are actually building uh, for the future. And I think so, most of you know that during the President's visit here in January, uh, our two leaders agreed to over 70 different areas of cooperation, 70. That keeps us busy uh, each week. And these initiatives include cooperation, again, on issues of space, on maritime, cybersecurity, and many uh, really are starting to bear fruit even just after a few months since the president left. You know, we've become used to saying, uh, Chale and Sas Sas, forward together we go. Uh, we can also now say the U.S. and India stronger together, stronger together when we work together. And I really believe that. That much has become crystal clear. We can do independent actions, but when the two of us come together, I think the Prime Minister said this most clearly in his interview with Time Magazine. He said the impact when the U.S. and India come together is not what we do for each other, it's the impact we have on global peace and prosperity. And I think that's, that's becoming clear. In the midst of signing uh, MOUs, collaborating on defense initiatives, improving economic cooperation, advancing health, we should not lose sight of our primary goal of bilateral cooperation. We work together because the summation of our efforts as best partners makes our citizens and the world more stable, more secure, and more prosperous. And because we endeavor for this better world, US and India ties become more necessary by the day. And unfortunately, at this moment, the shared values that the United States and India hold dear face profound challenges in a number of areas that threaten global security and threaten the international order. From emboldened terrorist organizations to attempt to discredit the principles of democratic governance to aggressive tactics in the seas and the skies, the values that define our open democratic societies are at risk. Now let me pause here to make clear that we condemn in the strongest possible terms the recent cross-border terror attacks and stand with the people of India and all free people in fighting the scourge of terrorism wherever it occurs. FBI Director Comey has pledged the full support of his agency and our government in supporting India into its investigations. There can be no place, no accommodation, no justification for those who carry out violence on innocent people. As President Obama said when he was here in, in New Delhi, the U.S. and India are united in this fight, and our two countries will continue to focus on building a better future that delivers greater security, prosperity, and dignity for both of our peoples. Now, it is the U.S. and India relationship that can help counter the trend of global uncertainty and reinforce the rules-based international order. In fact, what we do together has the potential to underwrite global security and prosperity for the long term. It is for this reason that the United States supports India's aspiration to become what Foreign Secretary Jai Shankar calls a leading power instead of a balancing power. 
Now, to realize this goal, our countries will not only have to work together on our bilateral priorities, but partner on global issues to strengthen this rules-based international order in which India has an important stake. You know, addressing a reluctant public over a century ago, the American naval strategist Alfred Thayer Mahon wrote in his famous treatise, whether they will or not, Americans now must begin to look outward. The growing production of the country demands it. The same can be said of India today. So the way that India chooses to define its own role as a leading power can have a profound impact on our shared interests in defending and preserving assured access to our shared spaces. Again, as the President articulated in the February 2015 National Security Strategy, these shared spaces are the arteries of the world, the, of the world economy and civil society. Assured access to these domains for all is critical for the governments of the world to continue to provide their citizens with rising living standards and security. Challenges to assured access to these shared spaces come from increased competition and provocative behaviors and can compromise the ability of nations to partner on collective security and disaster response. And I believe that as leading powers, cooperation between the United States and India to preserve the integrity of this public good can drive our bilateral strate strategic cooperation for decades and will lay the groundwork for the next big breakthrough in our bilateral relations. Let me start with the seas. The Latin term mare librum means a free sea for everyone and has been the foundational argument for freedom of navigation since the early 1600s. As transnational commerce has grown, technology has improved and new frontiers have been explored. 90% of trade worldwide is conducted on the oceans. Our food, our fuel, imports, and exports depend on the safe passage of cargo through the world's economic arteries, our shared sea lanes. But today, the safety and security of these sea lanes face genuine threats, including those from terrorists, natural and environmental disruptions, mass migration, and organized criminal activity. Piracy, hostage taking, and extortion on the high seas continues to breed uncertainty. However, we have seen the international community step up to work to address many of these concerns with the United States and India, often in the front. We are both maritime powers. Our navies engage in regular trainings and joint exercises as partners. Our leaders have explicitly called upon us to work together to strengthen maritime security in both the U.S.-India Joint Statement and our U.S.-India Defense Framework Agreement. We demonstrated what was possible when both our nations helped to found the contact group on piracy off the coast of Somalia in 2009. That has grown to over 80 countries, organizations, and industry participants. But we can do more, such as increasing our intelligence exchanges and collaborating even further on issues of common concern, such as piracy, counterterrorism, the illegal drug trade, and human trafficking within the Indo-Pacific region. Now, another area where our maritime interests align is in our dual commitment to counter the use of intimidation or force to assert unfounded territorial or maritime claims. Paraphrasing Secretary Kerry, freedom of navigation and overflight are not privileges, they are rights. And these principles bind all nations equally. And India has been a leader in showing the world how to peacefully resolve maritime and territorial disputes through international arbitration, as India has done with Bangladesh. But not all threats to the maritime domain are man-made. Natural disasters also affect the stability of the maritime domain. As leading powers, we must be prepared to react. And India has proven itself in this regard. In 2004, India immediately responded to the devastation left by the Sumatra Andaman tsunami, saving thousands of lives in South and Southeast Asia. There are countless of other examples of India's humanitarian and disaster response capabilities stretching from the Bay of Bengal to the Arabian Sea and beyond. So how, so how do the United States and India best leverage our strengths to secure the maritime commons 
and preserve the freedom of navigation. Well, to borrow a phrase from Ashley Tellis, our good friend, we should continue to make waves. The United States has committed itself to deepening its maritime and security relationship with India across all sectors. In March and again in April, high-level leaders from both our navies met to discuss how to improve our maritime domain awareness capabilities. We are well into the planning stages for the 2015 Malabar Joint Naval Exercise and are pleased that in light of the global impact of maritime security and freedom of navigation issues, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force will visit the Bay of Bengal to participate. We want to see this exercise continue to grow in complexity to better build habits of cooperation among our navies. As announced by Secretary of Defense Carter during his visit to India in June, we have also established a new aircraft carrier working group to support India's indigenous carrier program, a platform that will be critical to India's efforts to project power. And I'm happy to report the first meeting of that group took place this week in the United States visiting some of the most advanced centers for carrier development and carrier operations. We've also consulted on how to improve coordination on humanitarian and dis assistance and disaster relief. Just last month, Dr. Mohan led a co-led a timely discussion on the future of U.S.-India humanitarian assistance cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. The U.S. would be proud to increase its support of India's regional disaster, disaster response capability through increased coordination, preparation, more exercises, and more bilateral information sharing. Now let me turn from the seas to the skies. And let us not forget that freedom of navigation also applies to and depends on the skies. Skies that are safe for flight demand that nations abide by international law and respect overflight freedoms. Protecting such freedoms requires air power. To this end, the United States is working with India on aircraft development. We have established a jet engine technology working group to pursue opportunities for the co-production and co-development of next generation engines to power Indian aircraft. Over the years, India has also added C-17, C-130s, and P-8Is to its inventories which has expanded opportunities to share experiences operating common platforms. <clears throat> However, India faces a critical shortage of frontline fighter aircraft to patrol its skies and keep its airspace safe. Expanding our bilateral defense cooperation could help address this challenge, and I see no reason why the United States and India cannot build fighter aircraft together right here in India. These combined efforts will enhance freedom of, freedom of navigation in the open seas and skies, reinforce international law, and will demonstrate our commitment to the U.S.-India joint strategic vision for the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean region. Agile and engaged Indian forces equipped with the latest technology and information can play a critical role in ensuring that the international systems and trade routes that have lifted so many out of poverty in Asia will remain in place. <coughs> now let's transition from the seas and the skies to the stratosphere. The world has truly become reliant on space, a domain in which Prime Minister Modi, I know, takes personal interest. Last month, he expressed his immense pride and joy in ISRO's successful launch of five British satellites into orbit, and he has been a vocal supporter of NASA's New Horizon mission to Pluto, calling it a landmark feat. I would also note that President Colum, such a towering figure in so many ways, was also committed to deepen our space cooperation. He was a visionary in this field, forging links with NASA during a 1962 visit to the United States. The pace and scale of space cooperation between our countries has grown rapidly over a short period of time. NASA and ISRO collaborated on the Chandrayaan mission to explore the surface of the moon and on India's hugely successful Mars Orbiter mission, which completed its 100th orbit around the red planet last month. That kind of collaboration would have been considered impossible only a decade ago. 
But we have only scratched the surface of what we can accomplish in space. The opportunities that lie ahead extend as far as space itself. Partnering on space-based climate research and weather stations to better forecast weather patterns, water supply, and climatic disasters can provide immense benefits to farmers and citizens living in coastal regions. This will become increasingly important as the effects of climate change continue to impact our planet. We welcome additional path-breaking work between NASA and ISRO to explore deep space, taking us to the furthest reaches of, the, of our galaxy. Now, part of President Collins' vision for space cooperation was that the United States and India could help address the world's energy demands by making space-space solar power a reality. Now, that technology may be decades away, but he believed we should pool our scientific capabilities to realize the goal of a clean, space-based energy supply. As space-based activity increases, important questions must be addressed about how to preserve the space environment for future generations. How will the international community ensure the sustainability and the security of outer space? How can the pursuit of scientific exploration in space be guaranteed to all countries? How will we protect satellites and other resources from threats posed by space debris? While a general framework has been set by the UN's Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, there needs to be greater global consensus on how to protect space in the future. This will require Indian and US leadership. Our Declaration of Friendship specifically references our mutual respect for a, quote, an open, just, sustainable, and inclusive rules-based global order. India and the United States can together advance a vision of what constitutes responsible behavior in space based on transparency and international law. And I'm pleased that our governments are engaged in regular dialogues on these issues. The first space security dialogue took place this year, during which we discussed transparency and confidence building measures, the development of an international code of conduct for outer space activities, and how to enhance shared awareness of the space environment. As nations with significant space programs, we are interested in increasing cooperation on space situational awareness and orbital debris monitoring and mitigation. Now, India and the United States increasingly rely on satellites for communications, navigation, disaster management, and relief, treaty monitoring, sustainable development, and national security. We cannot allow our space-based assets to be threatened by entities that pursue disruptive and destructive counterspace capabilities like satellite jamming and anti-satellite weapons systems. We need to encourage the international community to refrain from any action that brings about damage or destruction of space objects. Joint leadership in global discussions can increase the likelihood of finding solutions that will preserve the openness of this critical frontier for future generations. Of course, it is in all of our best interest to protect these shared spaces responsibly. This means in the maritime domain, setting clear parameters for commercial fishing activities to avoid severely depleted stocks. In space, it means keeping Earth's orbits clear of debris to make it safe for all spacefaring and space aspiring nations. And in the air, it means combating dangerous pollutants that damage our planet and our health. Now, finally, let me turn to the realm of the internet, which has opened horizons almost as limited as space and proven to be a great liberator, providing information and services to those who would not otherwise have access. As Cisco CEO John Chambers said, quote, the internet brought the world closer together, changed the way we lived, worked, learned, and played, and gave every citizen of the world a chance to participate in the economic future. The internet is already influencing many aspects of our lives, including our businesses, governments, power grids, homes, healthcare and education systems, and social relationships. Promoting access to the internet, therefore, will be essential to advancing human progress over the 21st century. Over this past year, 
there has been a sobering increase of internet, internet misconduct that has caused billions of dollars in economic damage. Criminal networks targeting both the United States and India misuse the internet to steal information and profit at the expense of private citizens, businesses, and governments. Increasingly sophisticated state-sponsored efforts have infiltrated government and commercial networks. Extremist groups such as ISIL, Al-Qaeda, and LET also use the internet to disseminate violent extremist propaganda and mislead youth into joining their causes. Cyber criminals grow increasingly skilled in targeting some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Now, recognizing that the United States and India have been pioneers in the digital domain, we must continue to work together to combat existing and future threats through information sharing. For example, we recently provided information on a high-profile hacking group operating from India, enabling our two countries to take concerted efforts against these threats. Given the abuse of internet technology by illicit actors, we are also engaged in joint training and other efforts to improve the process through which India and other countries can obtain bank records and other forms of electronic evidence from the United States for use in legal proceedings in India. It is in our shared interest to seek collaborative solutions to the challenges of terrorist recruitment internet-based crime, and cyber-based threats to our critical infrastructure. I don't need to spell out the grave implications and potentially cascading effects of a catastrophic attack on a power grid, transportation network, or banking system. Perhaps the greatest protection against such threats is the regular and substantive sharing of information on cyber threats and hostile actors' capabilities. But to do so, we will have to continue to build information sharing mechanisms through law enforcement and intelligence channels and within our private sector too, as this is where the bulk of our networks reside, outside of public and government control. We must also continue to work through differences in our legal systems that can sometimes slow the sharing of critical information. But given the risks involved, these are worthwhile efforts. India's recent announcement of support for a multi-stakeholder model for internet governance was a critical step toward a future where all individuals are able to enjoy the benefits of a free and open internet, and all individuals have incentives to cooperate and avoid conflict. We share the view that preservation of transformational possibilities of the internet require all stakeholders to have seats at the table, including the private sector, civil society, academics, engineers, and governments. And we look forward to working with the Indian government to continue to support this multi-stakeholder approach embodied in a myriad of institutions that each day seeks to ensure the reliability of digital spaces. Our two populations are two of the most connected on the planet, which is in part a reflection of our shared values. It is incumbent on us to apply these values in shaping the quality of debates that will determine whether the internet will remain a truly global and open forum that drives prosperity and promotes free speech or devolves into a fragmented mosaic of discrete national networks. We must demonstrate the courage of our convictions as we address difficult issues and aim to progress on issues that are sometimes seen as in conflict such as maintaining public security while defending individual liberty. So in closing, it's clear that the problems and opportunities that confront our two countries and the world require a resolute commitment to partner beyond our borders. The steps we take should not only focus on tangible, realistic wins that serve our interests today, but on how we can cooperate to uphold our common values and project power together for decades to come. What we do together can be a force for greater peace, prosperity, and security in the world. The shared spaces offer us a platform to realize this potential. I look forward to your comments and questions, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Varma.
in such a short time you could not have given a more broad sweeping uh, <laughs> getting into the details of uh, the entire gamut of possible partnerships uh, uh, that are evolving between India and the US uh, whether it is uh, the freedom of the seas whether you're talking of humanitarian assistance the skies space uh, cyberspace interestingly cyberspace is an area in which uh, you know ORF has been very deeply engaged in yeah. And we are working to build a platform where the two, uh, with, with the two in consultation with two governments, uh, which is, uh, I think, going to evolve very rapidly in the future. Uh, but, the, but the key to what you have really said is that, you know, it's, it's really the values that define our open democratic societies. Uh, and that is the core shared common space that we have with us that we need to defend, that we need to protect and we need to build together upon uh, going to the future. Uh, and that is a way we will move together to underwrite uh, global security in the future, uh, whichever aspect of global security you look at towards a rules-based model for international governance. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for these words. Uh, the floor is now open. Uh, I'm so glad that you, when you were talking about space, you mentioned climate change. Identify, identify yourself. Okay, I'm from yeah. Alstom India Limited. Um, and I'm glad in, in your uh, talk about space, you mentioned climate change, you mentioned solar power, and you mentioned dangerous pollutants. Because atmosphere is also a shared space. And going to Paris, it, it's gaining more and more prominence. Ambassador, I would like your comments on three points. Uh, first is this, uh, though non-carbon emissions for thermal power plants, which India is now uh, you know, looking at, uh, in light of uh, President Obama's announcements on CO2 emissions from global power plants, what's your view on how India is moving? Because I'm quite clear on the coal finance part, which was a question I had asked you in the previous evening. Uh, the second point is on India's views on IPRs. Um, uh, they view it quite differently. You say IPR? IPR, okay. intellectual property rights. And uh, the third question is on, on the domestic content requirement on the trade side, because that's again something on which U.S. has a certain So if you could kindly comment on these three. Sure. Brief and easy. Was that? Brief and easy question. Yes, three. Uh, can we collect a few more? Sure, yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Swasan. Uh, is on? Um, uh, ambassador, uh, um, I wanted to ask a question about the global commons uh, that we understand the United Nations to be as well. Uh, and in uh, January, when President Obama had come here, the joint statement had very clearly spoken of support for India's candidature uh, at the United uh, Nations Security Council uh, as a permanent member. Uh, however, a letter written by the United States ambassador in April this year and then released in July uh, essentially says that the U.S. would prefer to look for consensus, uh, which, is, which, is, which is against the Indian position, really, uh, and that you know, there's no question of a veto, as well as only a moderate expansion would be supported by the U.S. Are we to believe the bilateral commitment or the one given at the United Nations? Let me, let me try to take these first, okay. since they're important. Let me, let me answer the U.N. question first. Let me, let me read you something, uh, Suhasini, uh, because I, I think this is important. I'll just read you a statement. It says, the United States is open to a limited expansion of both permanent and non-permanent members. In terms of categories of membership, the United States strongly believes that any consideration of expansion of permanent members must be country-specific in nature. In determining which countries merit permanent membership, we will take into account the ability of countries to contribute to the maintenance of international peace and security. As we've stated previously, the United States is not open to an enlargement of the Security Council by a charter amendment that changes the current veto structure. To enhance the prospects of, of, for success, whatever formula that emerges for expansion should have in mind charter requirements for ratification. I could go on. The statement I read is not from the April letter that you referenced. The statement I read is from 2009. They are the same principles that are contained in the April letter. One thing has changed in the last six years on the United Nations Security Council, and that is the American commitment to support India's bid, and they've done so explicitly. And so I would refer you back to the 2010 presidential speech at the Indian Parliament, where the president said, I look forward to a reformed United Nations Security Council that includes India as a permanent member. The 2015 joint statement, President Obama reaffirmed his support for a reformed UN Security Council. The 2015 speech at Siri Fort, 
why I support a reformed United Nations Security Council that includes India as a permanent member. United States policy is clear, has not changed. We support India's bid on a in a permanent Security Council and a reformed UN Security Council. And the letter that you reference includes the same principles that have been articulated for six years. The reference to having consensus is a reference to gain the support of the members of the not only the Security Council, but the General Assembly, because as you know, two-thirds vote is required. There's nothing different in the position. I've read the reporting. I frankly was surprised by it and want to reaffirm the strong U.S. position and commitment in this regard. On the um, emissions issue, let me just say, uh, without getting into the specific uh, kind of negotiations that, that India is undertaking with the international community, we've been, frankly, very encouraged by the statements that we've um, seen from the Indian government. We've been very encouraged by our uh, working relationship with them, but with all countries that have engaged with India. Clearly, um, India has a leadership role to play, and I think, uh, I think they, will, they will demonstrate that. And they've, they've made some very aggressive uh, moves towards renewable energy uh, with 175 gigawatts of solar, wind, and, and biomass. Uh, we look forward to supporting them uh, in that on those efforts. With regard to IPR, I think we've had a, uh, actually, again, a very good discussion on IPR in, in multiple forums, including in the Trade Policy Forum, where we can share concerns over IPR. We look forward to the, to the new IPR policy that, that is coming out. We had a chance to comment on that policy, which I think was a, was a good development. Um, so we, I, I think, look, our companies you know, I, there hardly a week goes by where I don't meet with a U.S. company technology provider who has been through the lessons in the United States or some other country and is here to help explore to partner with India in, in that regard. So, so I'm very, uh, I'm very excited on the domestic content requirements. The the case is kind of actively at the at the WTO. So. I don't want to prejudge where the final final outcome is, and um, we we'll just have to see where that that progresses. Our founding president, Indo-American Friends Association, we referred to S. Lee Tallis. He sent email three, four days back. Long article he wrote for the Force magazine, talking about defense corporates how it's booming. But he also mentioned the you know, issue of co-production and joint research. Not much headway has been made. There are some serious problems regarding some enabling agreement which U.S. expects India to sign. If you can enlighten on that. Now, we say are many positive things we have mentioned, but we also share the threat from terrorism. Well, our perception of certain actors is different than yours. Take, for example, Taliban. Now, India doesn't differentiate between the good Taliban and bad Taliban, but the kind of Negotiations well, look, I, going on. Ne neither do we. Our soldiers have been killed by the Taliban as recently as last week. So I think I think Excellent. our let me, let yeah, me, no. But I just want to make this point clear because yeah. I've heard this before. I mean, our our commitment to standing up and fighting terrorism is has been unquestioned, and our partnership with India in this regard has been unquestioned. So I, I just want to make clear the th the threat that we face from terrorism is real. Yeah. We have lost 2,200 lives, over 2,200 lives in Afghanistan. 20,000 U.S. troops have been injured, many of them grievously. So we take the threat seriously. We've committed a trillion dollars in assets to the fight just in Afghanistan. My question related to that, did the negotiations going on about the future of Afghanistan, you are there, Russia is there, China is there. Don't you think India should also have been there? Look, what we have said is that this has to be Afghan-led, Afghan-run uh, reconciliation process, and we support them in that regard. That's part of the reason we've been so aggressive in, in helping to stand up and train the 350,000 Afghan security forces that are going to be essential to preserving uh, peace and prosperity long after the international forces uh, come out. One thing that we've tried to do is ramp up our information sharing uh, on Afghanistan with the government of India and have had regular consultations on that regard, have had our uh, special rep representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan come out. And I think that's important. India is a cr critical 
player in the future of Afghanistan, as we've said. The, the aid and training and support that they provide for stabilization, the support that they provided to the um, civilian elements of the government, and the partnership that they'll provide long into the future is critical. That's, that much is, is clear and, and, and obvious. Oh, sorry, on, on co-production and co-development, I, I think, look, you know what the amount of defense transactions between the U.S. and India was 10 years ago? Zero. Zero dollars. You know what it's nearing now? About 12 billion. Okay, so periodically I think we have to take a step back and look at the progress. Is it exactly where we want it to be? No. The thought of interoperability between our forces, that was a word we weren't allowed to say a few years ago. We now plan for joint operations, not just on the humanitarian front, but in how we would apply force. Now, do you think that would have been possible five years ago or four years ago? We've come a long, long way. Red Flag, Malabar, Rimpac, uh, Boss. These are not just information exchanges. These are where the best fighters in all our services come together and learn from each other. Now, on the co-production and co-development, I'm glad you asked the question. We, you know, the, the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, I wouldn't look at just the six projects, even that were announced by the Secretary of Defense. Those are big and great projects. And I think the Carrier Working Group and I think the Jet Engine Technology Working Group will actually lead to some really big things. You have to look at all the joint efforts that are taking place uh, between our companies, and there's a lot happening. I just, you, you can just take one visit to Hyderabad or Bangalore and look at the number of U.S. technology and defense companies cooperating with Indian companies in the national security space. It's a lot. And so I think, I think we should look at what we've done. I do agree with you. We can do a lot more, and I think we will do a lot more. Thank you. Ambassador Smita Sharma from India today. You know, you mentioned that the FBI, FBI director, of course, has assured of all possible uh, cooperation in the recent terror probes as well in India. We've seen exchange of information those years happen between the intelligence agencies, even in the wake of the post Mumbai attacks. But uh, is there really hope that this will lead to some sort of an increased U.S. pressure of bringing those uh, perpetrators within Pakistan? to justice and, you know, executing them of sorts or taking them uh, to task. But uh, uh, they seem to be roaming scot-free within Pakistan. And the second question is, you know, if reports suggest that Mullah Omar was dead two and a half years back because of illness, what do you really make of those talks with the Taliban that uh, Pakistan sort of took a lead on, you know, from all the way from Qatar to Islamabad? Where do those talks stand, really? Yeah, I think, I think the you know, when the, when the president was here, he was very... Uh, forceful in his statements about the need to eliminate terrorist safe havens, to crack down on cross-border attacks and terrorism, and to also bring the perpetrators of the Mumbai attacks to justice, and frankly, to hold accountable all those who perpetrate terrorism. I think we've been, been very clear. We've delivered that message clearly to the Pakistanis. We'll continue to deliver that message clearly. So the notion of safe havens is something that we would strongly condemn, have strongly condemned it, and, and stand uh, against it. On the, on the talks, and I you know, just remind you I'm the ambassador to India, not the ambassador to Afghanistan, so I don't want to get too far uh, out of my lane and just say that the the principle of Afghan reconciliation uh, to be solve this now uh, running on two decade long uh, uh, crisis through political means is the path forward that the Afghans have chosen and that we, we strongly support their, their political efforts. It's also um, part of the deal that for those parties that want to be part of the reconciliation, they have to renounce violence, live up to the terms of the Afghan constitution, renounce their ties with extremist groups, support women and minorities, and ultimately Afghan-led, Afghan-constructed for the people of Afghanistan to chart their own future. We will be there with them as a partner, but it's important that they, that they chart this path in the way that they've constructed. Ambassador. This is that well. Ambassador, I would like to go a little beyond Afghanistan. The situation is of, uh, and the situation is simply a matter of concern to US as well as India. 
Well, the plus points in the situation is your understanding and developing relationship with Iran. But the minus point for which nobody has any clarity is the ISI threat. How it is, what is your assessment, American assessment, how this is going to pan out? Is it going to spread? Is it fairly in control? Or can you, can you wipe it out? Or something else, what is the kind of strategy U.S. has evolved to deal with this? Sorry, you're talking about ISIL. The ISIS threat. That's yeah, right, no. It, right. Look, it's a. I think it's a very, very serious threat that we've um, we've mounted a, a very significant uh, international coalition uh, together. You know, I was. Uh, I had the good fortune of going to our USS Carl Vincent, the carrier that was coming down off the coast of uh, Kerala. I took 10 Indian naval aviators with me. So it was a great afternoon to discuss carrier cooperation. But the reason our car aircraft carrier was coming through the territory, they were on their way back home after being in the Persian Gulf for six months conducting anti-ISIL operations. They were flying up to 100 missions a day just, just to, to combat ISIL. It's, it's a serious issue, uh, a security issue, a governance issue, a political issue. But at, at its core, we have to reject this kind of barbarism, this kind of terrorism, this kind of extremist thought and ideology. We've tried to build that coalition. It'll take many diverse partners to do it. And uh, it, it, is a, it is a struggle, but a, a, an effort that we, that we have to wage. And it's, it's serious, but I would say it's also contained. The, the danger of extremist ideology, though, is something we have to work on together. And we have to ensure that whether it's through the internet or through other forms of communication that people are not being enticed into this, uh, this kind of line of effort that is very, very dangerous to, to uh, you know, civilians and freedom-loving people. So this is a, a big effort and a big focus of our government. Uh, Professor Moni. Thank you, Ambassador, for Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, you used the word Indo-Pacific region. Yeah. And you also said we must be prepared to react if there are violations or threat challenges in that region. I hope you include uh, South China Sea as a part of Indo-Pacific region. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned that. It was part of our joint statement. It yes. was, it's been yes, part of our yes. uh, policy. Yeah, I said I hope that. Uh, and, and, now, we see there are very clear signs of uh, militarization of that region, even by using the reclaimed land and uh, what not. What kind of, uh, you know, we should be prepared to react, whether react together, react separately, what kind of a reaction is, is expected uh, on, yeah. on, on such threats? Look, I think, I think the importance of our, our joint strategic vision uh, for the Asia Pacific, including the, the South China Sea, was to stand up for these principles that we hold very dear together, including the peaceful resolution of disputes, the rule of law, uh, democracy, solving matters under the law of the sea. Uh, and so these are the principles that we want to come together and make sure that other parties in the region also support uh, those efforts as well. This is, not, um, this is not meant to provoke. This is not meant to inflame. But it is meant to stand up and defend the post-World War II order that the two largest democracies have helped support and defend uh, and provide. Now, look, the speech talked about why it's important that our two navies cooperate, that we have the, the latest capabilities. In order to preserve those values and also project power, and also India continues to be a, a regional security provider, the United States will continue to be a Pacific power, have 60% of our Navy based in the, in the Pacific. But ultimately, this is about supporting a rules-based order and resolving disputes peacefully. I really believe we can do that through dialogue. That is, that is the course. Uh, that is the preferred course, obviously, and that's the course we're on. When we have security concerns, we have to address them through dialogue, and, and we're doing that. I uh, the specific threat of uh, reclaimed land yes. and use of it for defense purposes. 
which is you know the militarization of the region. Right, and we've we have we have made our uh, views on the reclamation of land in the South China Sea we've made very clear that that all parties have to resolve have to stop those reclamation activities and and use the tools of under the law of the sea and international law to the extent they have uh, claims they want to pursue right yeah okay okay so uh, Gulshan Luthra from India strategic magazine just to follow up on this uh, about two weeks back there was a seminar in Morocco of all the places on the possibility of second Cold War due to the rise of China or China's assertiveness. If you could speak something on that, please. Sure. No, Thank I you. look, you know, it's interesting. When I um, hear Indian officials and U.S. officials speak about China, sometimes the points are interchangeable because I hear we both have elements of competition and elements of, of cooperation, which is exactly true. We're both... Uh, have these very complicated economic interconnectedness uh, to, to China. We both have security concerns. And we don't, uh, to speak for U.S. policy, don't aim to contain or constrain China. It's not on our interest to do so, but we do support the peaceful rise of China. And we have a robust dialogue with China um, where we cover the gamut of issues. And the good thing is India does the same thing, covers the gamut of issues in their dialogue with China too. So look, I, I think through dialogue, through continued uh, engagement, I think we can work out a, a number of these issues. I don't see, um, you know, the, no, I missed the conference you uh, attended. I, uh, I, yeah, one, I don't, I don't see it. Thank you. Uh, no, there, there are a lot of raised hands, but we are running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to allow one last question, and I'm going to be a rather excise some nepotism in it. Uh, Nishta Gautam. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Nishta, and I work for Observer Research Foundation. We've been talking about spaces and how, you know, shared spaces. I want to, uh, to take this discussion in the direction of exclusion rather than inclusion. You know, President Obama uh, recently said that racial relations were the most frustrating aspect of his presidency. Uh, just what, what, replace, what, replace what, race with gender. What, what, <laughs> racial, racial, sorry. racial. Okay, okay. Got racial it. relations. So just replace race with gender, and we have Indian frustrations <laughs> coming into play. I wonder if you have something to say to that. How to make the spaces more inclusive in these two aspects? Oh, it's a really, it's a really good question, and ultimately one for the the people of this country uh, to decide. Um, I would just say it, it's been a strong commitment of our embassy and of our of our programs to support um, people who are on the margins, people who may not have kind of. Um, who need that extra boost, so th through our aid programs, through even our uh, Clean Water and Wash Alliance programs on sanitation to help help people, which has an increasingly important impact to girls as well, and especially those girls in, in uh, middle school and, and, uh, and high school. Um, look, I, I think we know the answer to this question, which is we will both be stronger countries when all members of our society can actually participate, when all members have a shot to rise from the bottom of the economic pyramid to, the, uh, to get a shot to, to climb up the economic pyramid. I know that just from my own family's experience. I mentioned yesterday as I, as I visited a, a, a nonprofit organization that was working on, on sanitation that the two-room house that my family was from in Punjab did not have a, a flush toilet when I was there as a kid. Um, and I went back to that house just two months ago and to see the kind of two-room uh, property in that alleyway in the Basti Sheikh neighborhood of Jalandhar and now to live in Roosevelt House, I know that that is not a very likely path. <laughs> and that I only got there because our two countries have this promise uh, that we've 
made to people that working hard, education, opportunity, you got a shot. Now, it's a long shot. Let me tell you, we required a lot of help to get there. But I think both of our countries are committed. We have to be committed to helping all those people. Uh, that notion of stronger together, we're really only going to be stronger together if all those people in our two societies, immigrants, uh, people who, again, are on the margins, have the chance to participate. We're fully committed to that, and I, I think we have a strong partner in the government of India in that effort as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Ambassador Varma. Uh, that this brings us to the end, and uh, thank you for ending on that very personal note. I think as we talk about Make in India, the, uh, no, the, 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 the greatest contribution of Make in India actually has been, you know, in the, in the, in the Satya Nadella, the Sundar Pichai, and the Richard Varma, which we will keep on exporting uh, time and time again. And that is one part of Make in India which can never end. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Raja, over to you to conclude and give a word of thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think it's my pleasure to bring this afternoon uh, engagement with Ambassador Verma to a close. Uh, we could have uh, gone on for a while, as you could see a number of raised hands in the audience. But let me, uh, I'm sure all of you agree with me that uh, Ambassador Verma, I think you touched upon a, a very important subject. Uh, uh, it's also a difficult subject, I mean, to talk about uh, global commons uh, or the shared spaces. Uh, that there are many of them. There is the the maritime commons, the seas, uh, the the outer space, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, then you have the cyberspace. Uh, dealing with this, when I mean, each one differs in, from the other in many ways. But I think uh, in in some form, I think this the the prospects for greater cooperation in this area. I think represents the broader ambition. Uh, of our relationship, and I think you laid out quite clearly uh, that today we are not framing our relationship merely uh, in in a, in a in a in a very narrow sense of uh, shaping a particular a uh, balance of power situation in the region, but we're looking to the long term and and to see the to to recognize the importance uh, of this cooperation, not just for bilateral interests, but for structuring what has become uh, increasingly central uh, to the management of a global economy uh, at this point of time. Uh, from the time the high seas was called uh, by by this lawyer called Grosch, uh, from Grosius from the uh, Netherlands, uh, who was hired by Dutch East India Company to argue with the Kingdom of Portugal uh, on what should be the rights in, in, in the Bay of Bengal, just beyond Bay of Bengal, uh, what should be the rights of uh, passage on the, on the high seas. And I think that tradition of law as a, is deeply embedded in both our societies, uh, in the kind of divergences that have emerged between us over the last five, six decades, we often forget the rootedness uh, in of both of our intellectual traditions in common law and using the principles of uh, law and collective security uh, to shape the larger uh, international system. And I think that today we are poised in, a, in, a, in, the, in the right way uh, to begin that cooperation uh, on the base of the shared uh, tradition in, in common law to deal with the global challenges. And I think we really look forward to uh, working with you. And I want to thank the embassy for finding the time for you to come here. And we, uh, look on this, especially in this area, I think we've already done some work with our American friends. And I think we look forward to working uh, with American institutions as well as other institutions because this is going to be a great common enterprise uh, to deal with the challenges at the global level. So thank you again. And thank please you. join me in thanking the ambassador. Thank